town uh, select board and the town uh, elementary school board. And both of those uh, municipalities have contract with local uh, solar contractors to put in 500K in that magazine projects. The uh, high school board and the waste management district would also like to do that. The elementary board and the select board are both considering additional that bigger projects. We've got a 30 acre, approximately 30 acres, Dora, landfill. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, the way that that metering law currently is written, those four entities, those four municipalities, couldn't share, do a 500 each on uh, that site because of the, the prohibition for sharing infrastructure on one site. It happens to be at the end of a road that's got a huge uh, lumber mill, a whole bunch of commercial cons electric consumers, particularly CNS wholesale. So the energy would never get off very road. It would all be used there. And uh, the town would be able to generate, sort of generate revenue, which would save taxes and so the schools. And the waste management district could lower its assessment in the towns because it could also the projects. So um, we talked with our uh, representatives and our senators, and they're looking for a bill to attach that to. Uh, but so far, nothing. And what Ted is talking about is a little bit different in terms of going to break big projects. This is within the 500 pay limits, just sharing the road, sharing the dump site, and hooking it all up to me. And there's an the adequate substation on site. So the barrier is the 500 kilowatts that meter is half yeah, per, per site. Per site. Okay. Even if they're contracted to different people. Okay. Uh, well, the there is a perfect bill for that in the finance committee in the Senate, the net metering bill, and where your one of your senators sits, Senator Calvert. Right. So uh, there you go. Thank you. So and just really quickly, I, I will have to look into it, but there was a change in the net metering bill that did pass the House on 36 to 8, by the way, which was pretty impressive leadership. Um, that you could maybe get at what you're describing. I didn't understand the right of our example. It changed the premise rule. Well, you know, you can only have up to one project, 500 kilowatts per premise. That's the way it is now. So if it's four different entities, is that what you're describing? Yes. I, I can look into that and make sure it doesn't already exist. If the Thank you. Has to have That'd be great. And if you let Paul there is also, and it will come up this uh, week. There wasn't a pilot project for landfills that was contained in the house, but they just ran out of time. So it's something that, but talking to your senator. I can, uh, I will also talk to uh, Representative Klein, who's the chair of the Natural Resources Management Committee. It's basically a carve out for municipalities, right? An exception to that to the regulation. Great. On the um, public transit piece? Yep. Um, the, uh, I think 50% of the carbon emissions is from transportation and uh, um, a big part of that uh, comprehensive energy plan is shifting the uh, transportation to electric and um, I think the state's doing a good job with some uh, infrastructure for charging stations in, in the downtowns like we can, ac we can access funds from A&R Put in those, and they're staying ahead of the curve with how much, um, how many electric vehicles there are. They have great maps of um, because you have to register them as electric vehicles of who, you know, where they are, what towns they are, where the charging stations are. Um, but I don't know if there's any funds to put them like at, at park and rides or places outside of the downtowns. Um, the the public transit, what you're describing in um, in Chittenden County, they have a uh, transit authority. Well, I guess that includes now. Um, Green Mountain and, and Franklin County, and the uh, Transit Authority has an assessment on, on each town, and so you run into the problem where some towns buy in and towns in between don't, right. and so they're not paying in, and the bus route has to go through them. In, in Southern Vermont, we don't have a Transit Authorities, they're funded a little differently. Um, uh, Brattleboro is an, an exception because uh, uh, Brattleboro started with a strong public transit system, uh, well funded by the town. But for all of the other towns in Wyndham County, um, uh, Connecticut River Transit gets um, uh, rural public transit funds to operate and state operating funds, very well funded. But the local piece, um, 
they have to go to each individual town, um, do a warning to get on town meeting, and ask for a contribution. Right. And um, it's re really challenging, just uh, resource-wise, to do that. And the amount of funds small towns have to contribute isn't a lot. And, um, and there is that uh, local share that's required um, to get in there. Uh, where that can be a problem is with, uh, say, like upgrading a fleet. The, the, the newer buses, um, uh, the, the diesel engines have uh, 60 times less um, sulfur particulates than the older ones. But then also to get a, um, to upgrade it to um, an electric vehicle, uh, they, uh, the cost is just um, unmanageable. And then the local match, which is 20%, um, uh, is, uh, is also impossible. How do you get that from towns? So, um, so I think that that's the, the funding challenge in southern Vermont is... And, and I, I, my sense was that, that this is a consistent problem throughout the state. It doesn't matter whether you have a transit authority or whether you have a, um, a, a different uh, setup, there is this requirement for a local match. And mm -hmm. the local match is creating, you know, if, if the locality is unwilling to help fund it, um, are you going to withdraw the bus service from the locality? And if you're withdrawing the bus service from the locality, are you really creating the, the network that you need to actually sustain something that's countywide service? And, and, and I think that our challenge at the legislature um, is to figure out a way uh, to work with the different regions to create a more sustainable method for financing uh, public transit. And, you're right, I mean, we need a better fleet, one, uh, but we need more service. I mean, I, everywhere I go, um, and it's particularly true, you know, I hear this here in, in Wyndham County, but I hear it in, in Bennington County as well. They feel like, you know, their local service is good, but it needs to be better, and then it needs to be connected to the rest of the state. Yeah. Um, and, that's, and that's the challenge that, you know, we're really facing. And then, um, for instance, we were uh, trying to attract um, uh, low-income folks who can't drive to farmers markets, which are on Saturdays, and then the, a lot of the bus services don't run on Saturdays and there's nowhere to get there. Um, but th there are some, some models, like with Act 250, um, uh, impact fees could be assessed. Like if you have an $80 million development, the amount of traffic you're adding to um, uh, impact fees could be assessed to provide that local share. Um, but it, it, yeah, it, it is a, a challenge around the state. Um, and we have, you know, we have the density of development. You know, how, how do you make it sustainable? How do you run a route from, say, Halifax to Brattleboro and make it work? Right? Yes. There are those challenges. Yes. Uh, Chef, it's very easy for those of us who are deeply concerned about climate change, to see all the things that need to happen that aren't happening. Mm -hmm. But I am consistently proud of living the life <laughs> for the things that we are doing here. Um, Joey and I and a bunch of others uh, hosted some European energy, renewable energy experts last year. Remember them? And they came up to the state house. And when they got to Vermont, <laughs> they just sort of said, wow, you all you're reasonable here. <laughs> you think in a rational way in this thing. Um, so thank you and the legislator, legislature, um, through for the great work you have. Well, thank you very much. I, so it, I attend, every year I attend a, 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 a speaker's conference. Um, and uh, I've gotten to know uh, the Speaker of the House from South Carolina um, pretty well. And South Carolina is a little bit different. <laughs> I remember when I first <laughs> when I first met him, I was I was in this group of speakers and I said, "Well, this is this is the deal in Vermont. We have you know 45 Republicans, we have 95 Democrats, and then we have six progressives because Democrats in Vermont are not liberal enough." He says to me, "Mr. Speaker, we think that." The Democrats in Vermont are plenty. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
know, I mean, you know, we do, I mean, we think a little bit differently. And, you know, I, I, the, the sense of community that Vermont has always had, sort of the, the tension between the individual uh, liberty and community, um, I think has, has ways in favor of community right now, understanding that if we are not working together as a community, it's not going to matter whether we have any individual liberties because we're not going to have a plan. Uh, I hope that some other states will figure that out because uh, I won't go into it. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've got an opportunity here uh, at Brattleboro to have a wonderful book of a set of chunk. Probably one of the Makes the best college my life. Time is of the essence, and uh, Act 250 is going to be the challenge. So it's a request to see how to fast track. <laughs> and I have enough trouble to trying to fast track <laughs> things for the legislature. <laughs> 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 things that are in my control are already hard enough. Um, you know, it's a good who, question. Who, who should be the contact? So I, I actually think that uh, that uh, a, a team from economic development, um, and I would uh, work with uh, Pat uh, Walton Powell um, and A and R uh, would be good to just sort of to understand all the facets of, of what's going to be necessary and figure out a way to, to move it as quickly as possible. Um, That, uh, that at the NRC we've done work on Act 250 in the past and we work closely with the Natural Resources Board who administered the Act 250 permitting process. And a lot of times the delays are from incomplete applications. So assembling this team ahead of time and also talking with your district coordinator about the ins and outs of it will just make that process a straighter line for you by helping set um, realistic expectations. When you say district coordinator, what? Sure. I mean, what, um, what's that like? Inside district board. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, is it April Hensel? April Hensel. Yeah. Okay. And she's located in Springfield. Yes. Yeah. So all district coordinators are always there at the other end of the phone as you're starting a project. It can be a really great resource. Shep, I've got a quick question about the um, <clears throat> thermal efficiency financing package, and I'm afraid I got here late, so you may have touched on it. Um, did, did you speak on that? I have not touched on the thermal efficiency and financing package because there is not currently one. Okay, well, so what was it that the governor just released um, about? Uh, so uh, he was coming up with 500,000 or something, and right, so there was going to be 7 million a, available? Um, a uh, package that was put together. Some money from VITA, some money I think that the Department of Public Service found, um, leveraging um, some private dollars with uh, fuel dealers um, and uh, trying to get fuel dealers to do more work on uh, the thermal efficiency side. So, uh, and I can't remember what the total nut was, uh, but I will try to get that in. Um, you know, the chat, it has been a real, <clears throat> you know, we talked thermal efficiency financing, it was last year, uh, and the governor had proposed uh, $13 million paid for out of, or $16 million out of uh, break open tickets. And that was pretty unpopular um, in the House. Uh, you know, the reality is, if, if you were going to do it from a perspective of rationality, you would uh, have a carbon tax. Um, but it, that doesn't end up being a very rational conversation um, because usually you're having that conversation in the dead of winter when people are getting their heating fuel bills and they're like, you're going to actually make my heating fuel bill more expensive. And you say to them, don't worry, it'll be cheaper for you later. And people, uh, you know, it's, we're here from the government and we're here to help you. I mean, I, and, 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 I mean that's the conversation that ends up happening. I, I don't know how to get around that. Uh, 
well, it's marketing. It's it's informing it's informing the public and and shifting their attitude towards. Yeah, look what we did with smoking. I mean, that, it was a similar situation, and you had to change society. It is it is a marketing issue in part. Um, I think it's also I, I you know it, it needs. I think for it to actually work, it'll have to be a regional or a national issue. I, I'm just not sure whether we can do a carbon tax at the state level. Mm -hmm. um, I just I'm not sure. And, you know, the, these conversations are going to get tougher as we go to the electrification of the fleet. Um, we, are, we are going to consistently erode uh, our, our transportation fund. Um, and we're doing the right thing, but how do we actually sort of turn the knob on it so that we actually can figure out how to finance? Are we going to go to vehicle miles traveled? Well, then you get into a rural versus urban issue. All of the, the issues that we have to deal with over the next 10 years around thermal efficiency, around transportation efficiency, I think are going to be some of the hardest conversations that we've had uh, probably in the last 50 years. I was elected town energy coordinator in 1976 in Chelsea, Vermont. <laughs> and, you know, I come to these events and I hear the same conversations and the same issues being raised that were being raised when Jimmy Carter was president. <clears throat> Um, and, uh, you know, my sons are graduating high school and college this spring, and I'm realizing that, you know, we're not going fast enough to uh, make a difference. So, uh, so I don't know whether we're going, we're not going fast enough at the moment, but I actually think the acceleration rate is actually starting uh, to accelerate. Um, and so uh, my, uh, my hope is that the combination factors that are happening right at the moment, and that they're happening throughout the country, um, are such that we are we are going to see within the next 10 years uh, a real quantum leap of what we're doing in energy efficiency. Now, I mean, the, the challenge that we have right now, uh, I, I would have had been more hopeful three or four years ago. Right at the moment, the challenge I think we have is around the fact that we have so much carbon-based fuel that's coming online in the United States, and it's so cheap. Um, and, I, and I don't know how to address that particular issue. Well, it's, you know, we're just not considering the true cost of the fuel. I mean, the we're bearing from... The cost it into the power. That's right. The cost right. Of the so it's really hard, and as Bob said, we've been talking about this for 40 years. Yeah. So how can we make it Because I do think it's marketing, it's education, it's what's more broad public support for we've we've had the benefit of like paying not as much as we should be paying for a long time and it's gonna get hard. So how do we make it easier for folks that you work with to think about the long term benefits and the long term savings as opposed to the short term savings? Well, I mean I think organizing makes a difference and you know having constituents reach out to people makes a huge difference. Uh, and I think one by one, educating people about you know what does uh, thermal efficiency really mean when you actually make those investments, um, and, and, and introduce them to people who save money, who are living you know in warmer houses, the whole nine yards. And those kinds of things make a difference. On the transportation uh, side, I mean, showing people how. Public transit can work in this state, or showing people how carpooling can work. Um, you know, people are resistant, particularly around public transit, resistant to believing that it can work because they still have the rural urban mindset. Um, and I think if you can show them how it works in, in rural communities, then they're more willing to put the money into uh, the public transit. Mini park and ride coordinated service delivery from Halifax. And, you know, um, the it's fertile ground. Um, and the thermal efficiency, not I just don't know how to crack. Um, and, and, and it is maybe we need to actually have our session in June 
I mean, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it, it, it sounds stupid, but you know, there is a reality to getting a call from a constituent who can barely afford to heat their house in January, and them saying to you, "What are you doing down there, you idiots?" And and I can speak from experience that those are the conversations. Those exact words are said to you. And often so by family. It's snowing in Atlanta. Huh? And it's snowing and it's in snowing Atlanta, Atlanta, so what, what is this crap right. about? Right. Global warming. I gotta leave. We do have to leave, but I just saw Tom Simon come in and um, and he was saying something about the Atlanta Metro Police Department. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if that's true. Yeah. 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 Well, we're making progress very slowly, but um, the, uh, the state, of course, legalized growing industrial hemp, even though it's still not legal at the federal level. Um, and there was an amendment on the farm bill that um, allows uh, colleges and universities to grow test crops legally. In, in any they already state are. Where it's proved, <laughs> which is, it is in Vermont. So all we need to do is get some professors and students interested in growing industrial hemp, and uh, we can get stuck on that. I understand that it, that it is actually the solution to our regulatory and buffer problem. Mm. That's, that's the latest pitch that I've gotten. Chef, can I have 30 seconds? I know you've got to go. Um, <laughs> I'm going to jump in. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we're using all the tools that are at hand in order to change public perception. And I'm seeing it every day. I work online constantly. And um, I'm seeing how uh, you are able to talk to your neighbors in a different way than we were able to do before. Um, and I really wonder if we should be focusing some attention on using the uh, public platforms that are available <clears throat> to start spreading the word about those people that have had a success with doing a thermal upgrade on their home, put in solar. We need to see positive um, feedback from the people that have those those uh, aggressive people that are out there in front doing it. So I agree with you, Bob. And here's the challenge for me. I have one person who works for me. One. Um, and I can barely, with that one person, we can, I can barely answer the, all right. the emails on the phone and try to actually do public policy and uh, show up on occasionally on the radio and stuff like that. So I, I, that is not something that's going to happen out of the legislature. Right. And I, um, and I, I think, think I'm more interested in the rest of the room embracing yeah. the idea that yeah. um, we're not using the tools that are available. Yeah. Uh, you've seen some of my work online, yeah. and it, it can be quite effective. Yeah. I mean, I've had some amazing results that even surprised me. Um, so if, if that's true, then I hope that maybe you would encourage people to um, invest some time in looking at that. It's worthwhile. Yeah. I, I can sort of post some pictures of my family and that's... Did you do a stone interview? Yes. And I, I barely was.